For Kareem Media's policy, I'm Sashni Mali. Joining me today is Dr. Isaac Malgas, here to unpack his book, Power Struggle, Why Rolling Blackouts Continue. Your book provides a deeper understanding of South Africa's problems relating to insufficient electricity generation. And you begin the book with a history of South Africa's power sector. How did national and industrial policies shape ESCOM in the 20th century? And how did power ambiguity contribute to its fall in the 21st century? Yeah, so the book, it, it starts with power sectors in Africa. And the story of South African load shedding is uh, put in the broader context of insufficient generation capacity, which we have in, in Africa. But uh, coming specifically to, to South Africa, if one goes back 100 years ago, how uh, the electricity sector was started, and really the mines needed very cheap uh, electricity to keep the operations going. And uh, throughout the 20th century, the power sector was really premised on a basis where you needed low cost electricity to feed the mines with power. And then there were many things that have happened that have shaped it, that have influenced it. We've had in the in the 1940s, you had the National Party come, come on board. Uh, there was always concerns about energy independence and with, uh, with their policies, they wanted to make sure that they've got sufficient energy. So those are factors that shaped the power sector in the 20th century. And I think it was really in the 1970s when we had the oil crisis globally that uh, the policy was really shaped to try and get South Africa positioned. <laughs> and uh, at that time, you know, we had companies like Cecil that was started to just make sure that we've got fuels in South Africa. And that's really shaped it throughout the, the, the 20th century. It was always looking at low cost and how you can supply the mines and how you can get this minerals energy complex working so that the, the mine suppliers come with low cost coal and the ESCOM then supplies the, the mines in terms with the, with low cost electricity for exploitation of coal as well as other uh, minerals. And then getting towards the end of the of the 20th century, obviously we had a, a change of a political regime in South Africa. And then there were many other objectives that also came into play. So one of the one of the good things was in our dispensation post-94, and even before that, there was a lot of drive to get electrification going. You'd know that our electrification rate was very low. Most black people did not have access to electricity. So that was one of the social objectives that, that got going in that time. Uh, and obviously over the years, in the last 30 years, we've had the preferential procurement, which was also a, a social objective. And often these objectives are good, but at the same time, they add additional costs, and that could be uh, different kinds of costs that you can have on power sector utilities. And more recently, we've had the climate change that uh, that also has shaped energy policy in the 20th uh, century. And I think the underlining all of these is, is the power sector reforms that was started in 1998 with the energy white paper and if you consider we are more than 25 years on and we've not realized the objective of the energy white paper and it just explains the, the challenges uh, that, and that is the basis of the book how difficult it is to reform power sectors from where we have vertically integrated uh, state-owned monopolies to wholesale power sectors as what you see in, in, in some developed countries so, yeah, so it's been a, a complete turn of events in terms of how policies have shaped it in the 20th century. And in the 21st century, we needfully find ourselves in a different environment where other policies are, are equally important. And why have efforts to address the poor performance of SOEs been mostly unsuccessful? And what are the implications for continued investments in the sector? I think it's quite important to go back to why SOEs are there in the first place. So if one considers um, after the, the Second World War, many economies uh, in industrialized countries, uh, they've really felt the brunt of the war. And uh, after the war, they needed to have a state 
dominant approach to really lift the countries out of the out of the situations. And uh, with very little type of capital, there was a generally accepted view that it will only be the, the government and the state that can actually help rebuild those economies. And that is really where state and enterprises have, have, have became more dominant. And uh, with the Reagan and the Thatcher administrations in the 80s, we saw a rollback of that and there were lots of privatizations of, of state and utilities. And what was started as relative successes of those privatizations uh, through institutions such as the World Bank and other multilateral institutions, private sector participation became a solution or a touted solution for poor performing power sectors even in, in developing countries in Africa uh, and, and in South Africa. And that is really where our white paper has, has come from in terms of what the world view was in the in the 1990s. And when the white paper was established or written in the in the late 1990s, that was the, the prevailing view. We still have state-owned utilities being quite uh, dominant. And what has made it very difficult to transform the power sector is that in many African countries, there's a lack of private equity. Uh, South Africa is slightly different. There is some, some appetite for, for private equity, especially what we see now in renewable energy projects and, and maybe gas. And that's, that's helped a, a lot. There's also been fears within many countries that you have, you'll have a, lot, a lack of sovereignty if you, <laughs> if you give up your sector to the private sector. And many times governments have not been willing or, or even politically able to, to do that, given the, the populace and their voting constituencies who may want have wanted them to, to retain that. And we're seeing a lot of that play out in, in South Africa as well at the moment. So where there's, where there's a split in terms of where the, there are people that believe that the private sector should take a, a bigger stake of the, the electricity generation and where the ESCOM should take a bigger stake. And even as we speak today, we, we, we see that, that playing out. So often what happens is that the voting constituencies often want the, the state to take a more controlling share and a controlling stake in the, in the power sector. And then often what you find governments go with that. And, uh, and I think one can see that in South Africa as well as we have our, our political parties and as they formed, there's also a very distinct uh, split in the spectrum of, of, of where political parties would wish to see not just the energy sector, but many other sectors within the South African economy in terms of the state ownership versus fully being privatized. And the implications for continued investments in the sector? Even though we've got in South Africa, the, the public sector by far generates the most uh, electricity in South Africa through ESCOM. Uh, ESCOM's balance sheet is, is severely constrained and one needs the other forms of investment. The private sector has taken projects within gas in South Africa and the renewable IPPs. And uh, I think that is a good step uh, going forward. But I think what is important to, to note is that the revenues for those projects, when it go, as it comes back from your customers, from your distributors, all the way through the transmission, uh, going back to the revenues, that is what's under threat at the moment. And uh, I think we, we often look at where the power gets generated and the lines that the travel is down to the point where it gets to the customers. But one forgets that the money needs to flow back to generate that return on investment for those that have made the investments. And when one has a a situation like in South Africa where municipalities are, are unable to send the money back to generate the return investment, that's when the private sector gets very nervous and that's why we have to have state guarantees for private sector investment, which uh, I think we can all agree is not sustainable in the long run. And where the State-owned utility does not get their revenues. We've just heard that South African uh, municipalities owe ESCOM over 80 billion rand. 
So that leaves only the the shield, which is uh, us as the, as the public, uh, to to bail out Eskom to that extent. So in both cases, it's got some serious implications for for further investment when those funds don't come back to the investors. Now, your book also reveals how the state influenced ESCOM's culture and how performance management practices influenced the decline of the utility. Can you just briefly give our viewers some insights into this? So we've spoken about the, the in the 21st century what was what was really important, and even towards the end of the of the 20th century, when I joined ESCOM in the 1990s, the tagline of ESCOM was the lowest cost electricity for growth and prosperity. And it just shows you how that has always been ESCOM's objective. It doesn't matter what, what we do, it's got to be uh, adding or contributing to that lowest cost electricity that you can generate sustainably for the company and for its stakeholders. And that has always been the underlying goal of electricity generation in South Africa. But as I've mentioned, we've had other things that have come into play with the state capture, what we've seen, there's been lots of uh, corruption in ESCOM. So efficiency objectives were often left by the wayside. And often, often when you have that kind of discipline being lost in the organization, other elements of discipline also go. And with that was performance management. You know, so when one consider performance management at the power station level or at the departmental level or even at the individual level, it's not done as rigorously as what, uh, in fact, what ESCOM's policy still say uh, it, it needs to be done. So we've seen we've seen that the, the, the company also over the years have, has gone from becoming strategic. You can think back in the in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. ESCOM always worked out stations. So to build a power station from the first unit to the last unit to take a decade. So the planning, ESCOM had to be strategic in its planning. So when you do that, you've got to consider, well, resources over that 10 years that you're building the power station. But over the years, ESCOM had to become more operational and less strategic because of all the issues. And that's actually where we were and, and perhaps where we still are. We are very much operational, trying to get the units back up and uh, and trying to to get the the the, the issues that are hampering the the year and now being resolved. So that's uh, as often meant that performance metrics that look at the strategic objectives have been relegated to a lower level of importance, and uh, the, the the objectives is getting a unit back up this week or or, or, or next month that is often uh, more important. And I think uh, what's encouraging now is that one, one can see that it's starting to turn. And uh, with the relief that we have with load shedding at the moment, it does give uh, executives at ESCOM a, an opportunity to look a little bit further, see where we want to go, where we want to take the power sector to, and so forth. There's also been a very high turnover at, at ESCOM. So we all speak about the the 13 CEOs in, in 13 years that, that the company has had. And, and it's very difficult when you have that kind of instability for one uh, group of people or board or uh, an executive team to then follow on. Because often the people that came up with the plans are no longer there to execute the plans. So those that have executed the plans did not stay long enough to, to see them uh, through fruition. And like you mentioned, even though we haven't had load shedding for a few months now, there's still a lot that needs to be done to restructure the country's electricity sector and improve its performance. And independent power producers were brought in to plug capacity shortages that the state could not fill. But they face quite a number of challenges. So how do we promote private investments in generation? Oh, that, that's the million dollar question. I, I agree. So we have seen challenges for IPPs. Yeah, so the, the thinking is, well, the state is incapable of, uh, of rolling out the generation infrastructure to, to ensure sufficient um, electricity. The, the private sector needs to get involved. But we have seen big, big challenges for the, for the private sector. It's quite interesting when one looks at the different challenges that they have. So just for renewable energy IPPs, 
which have been the in the most uh, in number, the uh, private sector generators that have come on board. Uh, although it went quite well in the initial rounds, we're seeing uh, lots of difficulties with, uh, especially with wind, uh, where we, we, none of the wind uh, generators were allocated any capacity in, in but Windows 6. So with the objective of, uh, of, of moving towards a low carbon economy, what we're seeing is that the grid constraints is becoming quite a, a big challenge for private investors. So even though there are people that want to invest, uh, moving that power from where it's generated to where it can be sold and consumed is definitely a, a, a big challenge. We've also seen in areas where, and I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the, the car power uh, IPP. So if one considers that we have had IPP, the IPP program that's been going very well, and uh, if you consider the the program under which the car power ships was, was procured under, it was a risk mitigation, which means it was supposed to have been accelerated and moved much faster in order to make sure that it uh, comes online much sooner. But uh, that has actually been one of the longest running projects that we've had. So even though we've had other projects which was not under the, the risk mitigation program, <laughs> Those projects have come on sooner than, than, the, than the expedited risk mitigation program that we've had. And uh, so we see that there's a lot of uh, challenges in terms of, uh, you know, where there were perceptions or, or, or perhaps even real uh, allegations of, of corruption. Uh, many people in the public sphere were questioning the, 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 the underlying basis for the project, both in terms of it, its environmental legitimacy, as well as uh, you know, what are the actual costs, and why does the PPA, the Power Purchase Agreement, need to be so long if it's a, if it's something that we need in the interim to mitigate the risk of of power shortages, and maybe uh, in hindsight, looking back, if you look at what has happened with the load shedding being suspended, one then wonders we we may have been settled with a car power ship PPA for many many. Years and uh, the costs for them would have still been for the for the users of electricity or the taxpayer. So there are challenges. There are also regulatory challenges uh, for 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 IPPs. So it's not yet clear how IPPs will be integrated into the power sector. There's been no clear criteria that's been given by the government in terms of. These are the projects that IPP will bid for versus these are the projects that 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 Eskom will, will, will do. And uh, when it comes to uh, certainty, uh, one needs to at the top have uh, policy certainty uh, in terms of the planning. There needs to be certainty in terms of regulations. There need to be certainty. There needs to be certainty in terms of tariff reforms because ultimately the PPAs or or, or the tariffs are really what secures the project. So that needs to be considered as well as a risk. So at the moment, given how fast ESCOM or how slow, depending how you look at it, how fast or, or the speed at which ESCOM has been in the last year and a half turned its performance around, it does put a different picture in terms of whether the private power sector generation is needed and the speed at which it's needed and when it is needed. And once you you have this kind of instability or the uncertainty in the, in the power sector. Uh, it does make uh, those that actually do uh, project evaluation have to go back to the drawing board, understand their risks again, go back to their financiers. And that makes it very difficult in, in such an environment for IPPs uh, to enter the market and to and, and even to get have their projects, to, projects approved. So yes, I think uh, one certainly needs uh, policy certainty. One needs uh, transparency, and I think uh, that will go, will go a long way to addressing the concerns and 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 the impediments that uh, that keep private sector investment out of the sector.
Now, the emergence of hybrid electricity generation markets have created new challenges. So how do we respond effectively to them? That's the whole, the, the whole premise of the book. <laughs> and I think I've been careful in the book uh, to highlight that when I, when I started to look at these hybrid power markets, I myself ended up with more questions than what I've had answers. What we started off was with a, a vertically integrated monopoly. And uh, in terms of the standard reform model, from a vertically integrated monopoly, we would then transition the power sector through various phases. There will be different uh, laws, legal instruments that would enable the power sector to be transformed. There will be regulatory transformed. There will be tariffly transformed. But essentially, you'll enable all those reforms to end at wholesale competitive markets. And, uh, and when one has gone through that transition and you get to the other side, you've got all the means at your disposal to make it work, which means that there's, uh, there are price signals that uh, tell investors, well, if you look at the price of electricity, they're going to need peaking uh, or they'll need some base load in the future. So it's a good time to invest. We can we can project that the prices are going to are going to go up because it's actual market signals that are showing what the what the future prices of electricity is going to going to achieve. So when we are like South Africa and many other countries are stuck in in transition, it means we didn't get to that end state which has helped the power sector to move on. And maybe what is noteworthy is to, to look at the countries that have actually gone, gotten to the end state of wholesale electricity power markets. They function reasonably well, but uh, countries like South Africa that are stuck in the middle, that have not been able to get there, those countries have, have really struggled because in the past, you've had the state of the utility, in our case in South Africa, ESCOM, that had done all the planning. And ESCOM did transmission planning, it did generation planning, it applied for permits, it did the environmental approvals. But they had all the machinery to make sure that the power sector moves on. And you know that uh, after the 1998 white paper, ESCOM was prohibited from building until I think it was 2004, 2005, when it eventually got the go-ahead to, to build Madupi and Kusili and, and Ingula. So when you're stuck in the middle and the, the state-owned utility no longer knows if it's, if it's still the, the supply of last resort, it does make it very difficult to, to plan because a power station runs for 40, 50 years and you need certainty over the long term to do so. And I think that's the, that's the challenge that we have at the moment is under hybrid markets, there is no established framework for how it should work. And that is what the, what the book tries to put forward in the last two chapters in terms of perhaps one should look at, not, not, not just see this as a transition. If we've been here for 25 years in this transition, maybe it, it's an end state <laughs> and treat it as an end state, make this end state work rather than plan to go to wholesale competitive power markets as if we are going to get there tomorrow. I'm not saying we shouldn't go there. I'm saying it's a good thing. It's a good place to go to. But the realities and the complexities where we find ourselves does make it difficult. So in terms of the hybrid electricity markets and where we are, how do we make them more sustainable? The book does have some recommendations for how to make it more sustainable. But I think what the book actually maybe does more so is, is, is unpack where we are, how you got there. And then what's it going to take for you to, to, uh, to move there? The power sector transformations, the, the energy reforms that we've had in developing countries and industrial countries, those countries have seen very different conditions than what we find in Africa. And, uh, and it's not just the cookie cutter approach that you can take to say, well, let's now apply this to, to, to a developing country like South Africa. There are more complexities. There are definitely many more nuances that needs to be considered. And, and that could be one of the, the reasons why we found it so hard to transition to the end state. And I think 
Yes, there's probably some more challenges ahead for, for getting to competitive uh, power markets. That was Dr. Isaac Malgas discussing his book, Power Struggle, Why Rolling Blackouts Continue.